Pastor Mark has a sense of humor this morning. <laughs> How long does it take you to find that? <laughs> oh, Mark? That would be Mark. Yeah. Nice shop. Hopefully not while you were driving. <laughs> well, good no. morning, church. Good morning. good morning. Everybody that's here in person and online, thank you for joining us this morning. We just have a few announcements to get us started. Um, we're going to start with the first thing that we have coming up uh, this coming week is certainly is the continuation of our study is Genesis history. This week we will be covering the first seven days or the doctrine of creation. Now Pastor Mark's going to give us a preview of that this morning with the sermon and then we'll dig deeper on Wednesday night at seven o'clock so be sure to join us for that. Um, and then it seems like it's far far away because we just had racing yesterday but our next racing event is on the 10th of September, which is a mere 26 days away. So um, time flies when you're having fun. Um, I forgot, we do still have some extra books, so if you haven't joined the study, please feel free. And what reminded me of that is because I, I, I made some stuff. I like making things. Um, September 17th is our movie Tulsa. and. After we get done uh, with worshiping this morning and after the, the music this morning, um, we're going to play that uh, trailer. And that will also be in a link online for those who are watching online so they can watch it later. But we do have tickets. Take as many as you like, hand them out. Uh, front side just is this part with the Greek Street almost identical to what it is up here. But on the back side, a little information. They can scan that QR code and it'll take them to a, a spot where they'll get even more information. So. Be sure to hand those out. And that's it. That's all the announcements that we have. But let's uh, get ready to go before God and worship this morning. Father God, we just thank you for the day that you've given us. With as busy as life is, Father, we just ask that you would help us to slow down for the moment. So that we can take in the words that you have given to Pastor Mark this morning. That we can hear the message that you have given to him. That we can take those things to heart and that we can use them as we go out today. Let today be a day of refilling, of, of refueling for the coming week. Because Father, we know that if our tanks are empty, we can't show the light and the hope and the love that you have. Let us be filled this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Our call to worship this morning comes from Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 3, and it says this, Faith is the confidence that we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things we cannot see. Through their faith, the people in days of old earned a good reputation. And by faith, we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command. That what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. Now, this is the beginning of that faith chapter that we love to talk about. Because it tells us of the people of the Old Testament who were faithful. The men and women who were faithful to God through thick and thin, through... They didn't even get a chance to see some of the things that were promised to them. But here's something. In this first few verses, what the author is doing, he's, he's defining what faith is for us. And faith is acting on what God has revealed about his will and character. And it's the confidence of faith that our faith is based off of. It's God fulfilling his promises. Now, throughout the Old Testament, God has fulfilled, and the New Testament, God has fulfilled all kinds of promises. And we talked a little bit about this before. The, the promise of Israel being a nation again, everybody thought it was a joke for, what, 2,000 years? And then in 1948, what happened? It became a state. It became a nation again. So his promises are golden. They're good. They always come to pass. But here's the thing. It is through faith, and only through faith, that we can see our future. Just let that sink in a little bit. It's only through faith that we can see the future. This passage is the beginning point of faith, and 
and that is believing in God's character, who he says he is, and it's also the ending point in God's promise, he does what he says he will do. Now, doctrine of creation. Mark's going to be talking about creation this morning. No one, human-wise, was around at the very beginning. If we read Genesis, we figure, you know, we know that Adam and Eve came after everything else was created. But we do know what happened because God's inspired word tells us what happened. And it's it's a basic Judeo-Christian belief. Now, as we get ready to hear Mark's message this morning, think about this. God spoke everything into existence. Out of nothing. He spoke it into existence. As you listen to the message this morning, and you hear what God has given to Mark, God is speaking to you. <coughs> Are you listening? And if you're listening, Father, thank you. Throughout the scriptures, beginning to end, Genesis to Revelation, you reveal yourself. That's what we talked about last week, Father, the, the doctrine of Revelation, and you reveal yourself to us in everything. Father, we go through things in life and may not go the way that we want, but your promise is still there. And we know that you will fulfill it. It might not be what we want or what we prayed for right in that moment, but you have something for us. Let us hear you when you speak. And not only hear you, Father, but I pray that we would respond to what you have to say. In Jesus' name. Well, good morning, church. How's everybody today? Wide awake and ready to go? Awesome. Awesome. Well, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Wow, we got a great thing going on here. The doctrine of creation. What does that tell you? Well, a doctrine is a whole bunch of gathering of words together. And we're going to talk about creation a little bit. So when we talk about creation, we have to kind of put ourselves in a certain frame. So this morning what I decided to do is I wanted you to understand the difference between you and I and God. Okay? So the difference between you and I and God is, is that according to the book of Revelation in Revelations 1.8, it says that I am the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. Says the Lord God, who is existing forever and who was continuing existing in the past, and who is to come. The Almighty, the Omnipotent, the ruler of all. So this tells us something of the nature of God. But it really tells us who we are at the same time. We are not God. We are created in his image, but see, we are finite. So what does that mean? Because I know I've said this many, many times. So this morning, God woke me up and he says, Mark, you thought you had your message all done. So last Wednesday, I had my message printed out, brought it in, had it in the notebook, put it up here on the podium, had it all ready to go. And then he wakes me up, he wakes me up this morning and goes, nah, you're not done yet. <laughs> And so I had to go and reprint it, but he gave me a really neat revelation, an illustration that I need to do for you guys. So bear with me for just a minute. I want you to look around the room, see if you see anything different. Now, I know you're going to see one thing different this morning because you're watching me do it. Okay. So 
So, this is the Greek letter alpha, and it's the beginning of their, in, of their alphabet. So this is alpha. And over here, we have omega, the ending letter in the alphabet. I am the beginning and the end. So is anybody going to ask the question? Isn't the dot? Oh, what's the dot for? Yeah. See this little speck on the wall here, that little red dot? That's us. So what I wanted to do is kind of give you an idea of, of who God is. See, he's transcendent of time. He's transcendent of what you and I are. We are finite. We're this little dot. Now, because God is infinite, he existed before time began. But I didn't want to put it all the way over on the other side of the lot over there because it wouldn't do us any good for the illustration. So I just decided I'd stretch down the wall and say, God is the beginning and he is the end and he is finite. So really, that goes on forever and that goes on forever. He is not finite. So what we have to do is we have to take a look at this and we have to understand that God is infinite. There's no beginning, no ending. He was there at the very beginning because he created the beginning and he'll be there at the end so that leaves us so in God's timeline we're just kind of a little blip on the radar if you will God created the heavens and the earth so did he do it just for fun out of whim was he just kind of bored and needed something to do to pass the time? No. Nope. So in order to understand the nature of God, we must first understand that God does not exist as a man. One of the biggest problems we have as humans is we try and put God as a human figure out here and assign him human attributes. But he's not. He's God. He's different from you and I. And so our understanding of God, we tend to put into human context. We try and make him human just like us, with all the faults, with all the problems, with all the worries and everything else, but he's not. See, God is omnipotent. He is omnipresent. So when we talk about omnipotent and omnipresent, a couple of big $50 words to throw out there. He's not limited by time or power or space. So he is transcendent, but he is also imminent, which means then that he is integral in the design and functioning of his creation. He is involved daily with our lives. So we take this massive being that has no beginning and no end, and yet he cares about you and I. This little speck over here. We're very important to him. We are perfected in his creation. So when we think about God, we need to put it into perspective. We need to look closely at the world around us and look at how, how integrate everything is. How we are integrated in and all the little functioning systems that we have within the universe are intermingled, interconnected with each other. So a couple weeks ago, I showed that video which really put things in perspective and it was called God's eye view and we're going to take another look at that this morning here because I want you to really get a good feel for what God's creation is all about
So when we think about that, God created the heavens and the earth. He created you and I. But the intricacy of what he created is really hard for us as humans to fathom. When we take a look at the advance and the expanse of the universe out there, it's never ending. God is never ending. God created the heavens and the earth, and he did it for us. I want you to sink that in. Get that down to your very core, that God created the heavens and the earth for us. And all of the creatures in it, we're going to talk about that in Genesis here in just a moment, in the actual doctrine. But God is the master architect of the universe. None that could come just together by random chance or random happening or the primordial ooze that kind of created and formed itself into everything that exists. It doesn't work that way. No matter how much time we throw at it, it cannot happen that way. It is a created, designed, specific universe. Every creature, everything within each creature, all the way down to the atomic forces that are at work within us, are created and designed to interact with one another. They're interconnected with one another. It is beautifully crafted and wonderfully made. We need to sink that in. We need that to be the core of our understanding, that it is beautifully crafted and wonderfully made. It's not a happenstance. It's not an evolution of goo. It is a creation of a master architect of the universe, a caring, loving God that no matter if he is completely infinite, he cares about us and created us down to the infinite level. Some atomic particles that work together to make us function so that you can hear and see and understand exactly what I'm saying today. God is an awesome God. We need to understand too what goes along with this, what it takes to build all this stuff. First off, he has to have a master plan to put it all together, right? And it needs to have a purpose. And everything that is in God's creation has a purpose. We see that from the scriptures. The scriptures tell us that everything in God's creation has a purpose. You and I have a purpose. Our dogs have a purpose. And it needs to perform a specific function. So everything has to function within. And each of these sub-assemblies that go together have to have a function in order to serve the purpose to be the created item. See how that works together? They all interwork together. And it also has to have a fulfillment in its function. Meaning, it comes together to fulfill a specific purpose to fulfill that creative process. And it needs to have a specific outcome. Now in engineering, when we go to engineer something, we look at the outcome first. We say, okay, what do we want it to do? Okay, what do we want this to be? And so as an architect or an engineer, you look at it and you say, what do I want the outcome to be like? And then I'll build it backwards to make it happen. And so when we take a look at this, we want to make that understanding when we're thinking about creation, we're thinking about the universe, we're thinking about that plan, that master architect plan that God had for the entire universe, you and I and everything in it, every creature, every ecosystem that exists within God's creation are interrelated with each other. And we're part of that. So let's go back to Genesis 1 and let's take a look at that creation doctrine, that story of creation that God has put in his word and told us about because we weren't around when this happened. The writers of the book weren't around when this happened, but God gave us his divine inspired word to somebody to write it down. So today in 2022 on August 14th at 10.02 in the morning, we can understand what God did for us when he created all these things. That's where we are today. That's who we are and where we are. We're, we're a dot. But we mean so much to God. 
We have a purpose. We have a plan. He has a plan for each and every one of us individually. So think about that. How many people exist? And he has a plan for each and every one of us individually. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was barren with no form of life. It was under a roaring motion covered with darkness. But the Spirit of God was moving over the water. The first day, God said, I command light to shine. And the light started shining. God looked at the light and saw that it was good. He separated light from darkness and called light day and darkness night. Evening came and then morning. Day one. That was the first day. The second day, God said, I command a dome to separate the water above from the water below. And that's what happened. God made the dome and named it sky. Evening came, and then morning. That was the second day. The third day, God said, I command the water under the sky to come together in one place so that there will be dry ground, and that's what happened. God named the dry ground land, and he named the water ocean, and God looked at what he had done and saw that it was good. And God said, I command the earth to produce all kinds of plants, including fruit trees and grain. And that's what happened. The earth produced all kinds of vegetation. God looked at what he's done. And it was good. Evening came. And then morning. That was the third day. The fourth day, God said, I command lights appear to the sky and separate day from night and show the time for the seasons, special days, and years. I command them to shine on the earth, and that's what happened. God made two powerful lights, the brighter one to rule the day and the other to rule the night. He also made the stars. Then God put these lights in the sky to shine on earth, to rule day and rule night, and it was good. Evening came, and then morning. That was the fourth day. The fifth day, God said, I command the ocean to be full of living creatures, and I command birds to fly above the earth. So God made the giant sea monsters and all kinds of living creatures that swim in the ocean. <clears throat> he also made every kind of bird. And God looked at what he had done, and it was good. Then he gave the living creatures his blessings, and he told the ocean creatures to live everywhere in the ocean, and the birds to live everywhere on the earth. Evening came, and then morning. It was the fifth day. On the sixth day, God said, I command the earth to give all kinds of life to all kinds of tame animals, and wild animals, and reptiles. And that's what happened. God made every one of them. Then he looked what he had done, and it was good. And God said, now we will make humans. And they will be like us, and we will let them rule the fish and the birds and all of the other living creatures. So God created humans to be like himself. He made men and women. God gave them his blessing and said, have lots of children, fill the earth with people and bring it under your control. Rule over the fish of the ocean, the birds of the sky, and of every animal on the earth. I have provided all kinds of fruit and grain for you to eat, and I have given green plants as food for everything that breathes. These will be food for the animals, both wild and tame, and for birds. And God looked at what he had done. All of it, all of it, was very good. Evening came, and then morning. And that was the sixth day. On the seventh day, God rested. God rested. God created the heavens and the earth for
Man was created to worship God and be the steward over his creation. Man was created to serve God, and God gave man dominion over the earth and all the plants and creatures to tend to it, to work it, and to make it prosper. The stars from the heaven were to serve man with signs and seasons, creating a calendar and a sense of time. And all these things are relational to one another. One affects the other. God created man to have a relationship with him. In order for God's world to function properly, it was engineered to interrelate with each other. Complex ecosystems interrelated in order to function together to serve the purpose for which they were created. Intelligent design. Engineered processes to function together for an outcome that God had, a world that he created for us. Wow. So in engineering, we identified a desired outcome, and then we build all the subcomponents made up of a myriad of parts to fulfill that desired outcome. It needs to have a purpose and to perform the desired function in order to fulfill that objective that, that we have. Sound very familiar now? Mm -hmm. See why it couldn't just come from primordial ooze and come up and just go, oh, here we go. <laughs> it's all here now. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. That is what God did when he created the earth. He built all of these intricate subsystems down to the to the atomic level to interrelate and interact with one another in order to function properly, in order to give us this world that we live in, in order for us to be able to function ourselves. We're a very, very complex mass mechanism <laughs> built up of thousands and thousands and thousands of subsystems below it. And it wasn't by happenstance. It was all part of an engineered plan to fulfill God's purpose. Mm -hmm. We see the intelligence in the design all the way down to the subatomic level. The grandeur and splendor of the world that we live in is made so that we can fully understand <coughs> and worship a truly magnificent God. Mm -hmm. God created the universe out of nothing by the power of his word. This reveals his transcendent power. Goes beyond anything that we can imagine. That's what transcendent means. It transcends our understanding as mere humans. Nevertheless, he created everything for man and women to be able to walk with him and know this. That reveals his eminence. That reveals his eminence. And that gives us the reason to worship God. That's why we worship God. It's because he's done all this for us. He transcends anything we can understand. People try and put God in a box. That's what I started with today. We've got to take God out of the box in order to understand how great he is, how magnificent, and the grandeur. When we look back at our call to worship this morning, we see it spelled out then in Hebrews 11, 1 to 3. Faith is the confidence that we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things we cannot see. Through their faith, the people in days of old earned a good reputation. By faith, we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command. That now we see did not come everything that can be seen. We can't see God. But by faith we understand that God created all this for us. And that God is here with us today. God is in this very room by his word. He tells us that when two or more are gathered together in his name, there I am amongst you. He's here with us today. We can't see him. We can see all of the things that he created. All of the things that we created. Faith comes 
from the fact that we cannot see, but that we believe in God. So now we see faith come into the picture. And why is faith important in the understanding of the creation? Faith is trusting that God's word is powerful and that what he reveals to us in his word is true and accurate. So, the next question that I ask is, well, why can't we see God? Well, if we look at his word, he tells us that God is light. Not physical, but in spirit. People who came into God's presence, came into God's presence, were physically changed, transformed. His brilliance was such that they could not gaze directly upon him. His word tells us so. God reveals himself to us through his world and through his word. And as we build our relationship with God, he reveals more and more of those secrets that he has for us in this world to us. As believers, as our faith grows, our relationship with God grows, he reveals more of these treasures to us. The Bible calls it mystery. Those who have no relationship with God or those who have never seen and don't believe are blinded to his secrets. It takes faith to have holy revelations through the Spirit of God living within us. Why do atheists exist? Why can they not see? They don't believe. They have no faith. Or they have faith in the wrong things. And in doing so, they are blinded to the secrets that God has. We as believers, he reveals these things through the Spirit of God living within us. Our study tells us the power of faith does not come from inside a person, but from the dependability and the power of the person being trusted. Think about that one. So as we study and we, we are learning about God, see that faith doesn't come from within us. It comes from our ability, from that dependability, from that truth that God has laid down for us. And I'm calling God a person at this point in time because it's easier for us to fathom that. But the power of the person being trusted, that's where our faith comes from. That's very, very important to understand. So we as Christians, as our faith grows, as our understanding grows, we understand more of the truth of God. We understand more of his infinite abilities and of his wondrous gifts and of his grace, his mercy, and his love. See, anyone who can create everything out of nothing has got absolute power. We have to understand it. Therefore, if he's got absolute power, we can trust in him completely. If we trust in him completely, then our faith will grow because God is living within us. If we trust in him completely, if we submit our will to his and the Holy Spirit living within us, our faith will grow automatically. Our faith then overcomes doubt. It overcomes fear. It overcomes all of the obstacles that would keep us separated from a right relationship with God. God created the universe and everything in it in six days. And on the seventh day, he rested. See, and he did that for us. He didn't need to do it for him. He needed to do that for us. He did this to create the structure of time for man to live by. In other words, time was created for man, not man for time. That's very important to understand. As I said earlier, we were created to work and be stewards of the world that God created for us, but we are all given a plan for rest as well. We were given an example to follow that God said, I created all these things, but yet I need to rest. You as my creation can create all these different things. We were created to create we talked about that three weeks ago in that sermon. We cannot continue to work and be healthy. Our bodies need to rest to rebuild 
and recuperate. It's pointed out in our study that most of the major divisions of time are based on astronomical cycles. The days, the months, the years are all based on solar instances that are out there. Revolutions of the Earth, revolutions of the moon, revolutions of the sun. God put all these things in place to give us an idea of time. The seventh day goes all the way back to creation, at the point of creation. We need to think about that. That's God's time. Not based on anything that we can observe, but from the very first week of creation itself, God set aside time to rest. Therefore, we have a constant reminder that God structured the creation on a pattern of six days of work and one day of rest. For our well-being. We serve a mighty God. Gracious. Full of grace. And mercy. And love. Amen? Amen. 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 Mark 2 tells us in verses 23 to 28. One Sabbath day as Jesus was walking through some grain fields. His disciples began <coughs> breaking off heads of grain to eat. But those ever vigilant Pharisees were out there. And they said to Jesus, look, why are they breaking the law by harvesting grain on the Sabbath? So Jesus said to them, haven't you ever read in the scriptures what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He went into the house of God during the days when Abathar was high priest and he broke the law by eating sacred loaves of bread that were only allowed for the high priest to eat. He also gave some to his companions. Then Jesus said to them, The Sabbath was made to meet the needs of people and not people to meet the requirements of the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even over the Sabbath. Now how many times have we read that passage or been in church and had that passage read to us before and it made no sense? See, in Unless we have that concept of what God created and why he created the day of rest and the reasons for it, then this passage really doesn't make a lot of sense to us. It doesn't really gel, but when we think about it in those terms, God created that time for us to rest, not us for rest for that time. So you're going, well, wait a minute. I've read the Ten Commandments. Doesn't that fly in the face of the fourth commandment God gave Moses, which was, remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but the seventh day that is a Sabbath, a Sabbat, a day of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. On that day, no one in your household may do any work. This includes you. Your sons, your daughters, your male and female servants, your livestock, and any foreigners living among you. For six days the Lord made the heavens, earth, and sea, and everything in them. But on the seventh day he rested. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart as holy. And we are to keep that holy day in honor of God and dedicated to God. Let me reread that. We are to keep that day holy in honor of God and dedicated to God. Now, what I want you to understand is the word work that's used in that is meant to toil for profit. Okay? Toiling for profit. Instead, keep it for God and your family. So I want you to understand what that means. All right, so I'll ask the, the question about the elephant in the room. All right, Mark, you and Pastor Terry, we get up here and work on Sunday. Yes, we do. We also do it in honor of God. We do it for the glory of God. We so, certainly don't do it for profit, as neither one of us take any money for being pastors of the church. We are all given a small amount of time on this earth. God has given us directions on how to have a fulfilled life. That's part of this day of rest. If 
we toil each and every day, we will not have that time for rest. We will not have a fulfilled life. He's given us the guide on how to live as godly people in community with each other in his holy word. And we need to follow those directions. We talked about that last Wednesday night in some of the study that we were doing at that point in time. God's direction, his revelation, his doctrine of revelation. We need to be people in commune with one another. Community with one another in his holy word. We need to be good stewards of our time here on earth in order to have the life that God has for us in the presence and then in the future. We need to live it out wisely. Live it out wisely in the guidance of the Holy Spirit living within us. So Moses offers us this psalm. It's a prayer, Psalm 91 through 5. And he's talking about God is eternal. It says, O Lord, in all generations, you have been our home. You have always been God, long before the birth of the mountains, even before you created the earth and the world. At your command, we die and turn back to dust. But a thousand years mean nothing to you. They're merely a day gone by. Or a few hours in the night. You bring our lives to an end just like a dream. Imagine that. God's in control. Or not. God created all of this for us. He created us to serve him. To be in awe and majesty of his word. To be in awe and majesty of his creation. So that we can worship him, bring him worship, bring him honor and glory. So that's what we try to do on Sunday mornings. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for the blessings of this life that you have given us. And we thank you for another day in your presence, another day of life. We thank you for your son, Jesus, who took our sins to the cross and made a way for us to have everlasting life with you in heaven. Dear Lord, open our eyes to see and our ears to hear and our hearts to receive your wondrous blessings in this world that you have created for us. Help us to be good stewards of these gifts and share them with others who have not come to know you yet. Help us to bring those who have strayed away back into the fold. Help us to be that beacon of hope in a very weary world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I don't know about you all, but that dot makes me feel pretty insignificant. <laughs> right next to the cross and it's a red dot is perfect for right now as we come to this time of our service where we celebrate Jesus' last meal with his disciples. On the night Jesus was, was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body broken for you. Take In the same way, later in the meal, after they had sung a hymn, he took the cup and he filled it, saying, This is my blood shed for you. This is the new covenant. This is the covenant that God now has with us. That if we believe in his son, that we have a relationship with his son, our sins are forgiven because Jesus was the final sacrifice. So, as insignificant as that dot may make me feel as I walked up here, that dot is huge to God. i got to believe that that was intentional for this, back for 
this background. What you can't see up here, but I can actually see on the screen, is that there are different blue and green pixels that are just sparkling up here. And it tells me how important we are to God, that he cares that much, that he loves us. This week's been kind of tough for me, but uh, and, and it may be tough for some of you. Um, but God reminded me through a prayer, a prayer from a friend that He is in control, and no matter what happens in this life, we are to continue to pray for each other through all circumstances. In First Thessalonians 5, 16, 18, be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, not just some. At all. And for this is God's will for us in Jesus Christ. So, would anybody like prayer this morning? For travel, please. For travel, for Mark. Oh, yeah. you You're quite the traveler, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> it's like nonstop. <laughs> for, for healing. For healing for you, Don? Yes, please. Okay. I've got a healing one out there, too. Okay. Do you want to name them or mm -hmm. not? No. Okay. Okay. Oh, well, Father God, we just lift up Mark and, and we just ask for safe travels as he travels to and from everywhere, Lord Jesus. And we thank you that you bring him back safely so that he can uh, uh, preach to us and, and teach us your word, Lord Jesus, and while it's here. We thank you, God, for that. We ask you for healing for Dawn. You know his body, Lord Jesus. You knit him in his mother's womb. We ask that you completely just um, be the physician that we that you that you are, and we ask you for the healing power to just wash over him. Let the blood of Jesus just wash over Don and just heal him completely, Lord Jesus, and and just uh, keep him in your loving arms. Father God, we lift up Leah, who tore her calf muscle. Lord, you know her completely. She's knit her muscle back together as perfectly as you created her. For we know with you all things are possible, and we trust you for her healing and comfort. Let her know it was you that healed her, and may she praise your holy name. And Father God, we lift up Atlas and Kim's family and friend. You have heard the request for help for their family members and their friend with cancer, I pray continued intervention for all of them. You know each personally well. Please help each one according to their personal needs and your will for their lives. Please walk with Atlas and Kim and their family and wrap your loving arms around them and give them the strength and energy for each new day. Thank you, Father God, for this family. Lord Jesus, please be with Denny and his sister. Comfort them. Please give Denny the opportunity to go see her again and keep her mind steady so that they may have a beautiful time to remember. Keep them both in your loving care. And be with Denny um, for his, uh, his mobile home court has been purchased by someone else. 
Help those people to have compassion for the people that live in this court, Lord God. Do not raise the rent, Lord Jesus. Keep it as it was for all those living there, and just be with them and help them not to um, overstep their boundaries, Lord Jesus. Keep them in your control. And Father God, we thank you for Grace Street Church and our ministry and the ministers, Mark and Terry, and their wives, Lori and Diane who continually serve unconditionally for the good of the church and to lead those that will to Christ Jesus. We thank you, Jesus, for their lives and all they do to further your kingdom. We are truly blessed. Please let your Holy Spirit move in and through the lives of the people in this church and those online, Lord. Let our church grow to bring many to worship you, Jesus. Let us all say the short prayer um, together. Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Wash me, cleanse me, love me right where I am, and walk with me to victory in Christ. I believe in you, Jesus. You died for me to set me free from sin and oppression. So please accept me as your child. Thank you, Jesus, for your mercies and amazing grace. And we thank you, Father God, that you are closer than a friend. In Hebrews, 13.5, it states, Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. You are our comforter in times of need. Thank you, Jesus, for all you do for us. It's more than we deserve. As it says in Psalms 121, 1 and 2, I lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord the maker of heaven and earth. Praise be to God on high for loving us even when we are not worthy. Thank you, Jesus, for never letting go. We never walk alone. Let us yield to the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' holy name, amen. brings us to the end of our online session for today and our uh, messages and I uh, thank everyone for joining us this morning. Let us go to God in prayer. Please pray this uh, prayer silently along with me. Thank you gracious God for this day, another day in your presence and another day of life dear Lord. Thank you for the blessings that you give us each and every day. Thank you for the life and love that you give to share with one another. Lord, we thank you for your son, Jesus, and the sacrifice that he made to save us from our sins. Lord, today we confess that we are sinners. We are in need of your grace and mercy. We repent of our sins today. Come into our hearts. We make you our Lord and Savior. Lord, we pray all this by the power and the blood and the love of Jesus, that by his power and by his might and by his love, that we can be redeemed, that we can be made whole and right with you in the relationship with you, dear Lord. Holy Lord, you sent your Son to save us, and we pray today to be reconciled to you, we pray to live in Christ and to let go of our worldly desires and instead follow where Jesus leads. May we be made new in Christ today to be reconciled to you, dear Lord. Father, help us to be forgiven of our sins through your great mercy and your grace. Loving Father, thank you that your word is powerful and effective, that it is living and active in our lives each and every day. You have promised that I do not need to be anxious for anything, but in everything and in every situation, I should present my request to you humbly, with an earnest heart. Lord, I lift up my relationship to you today and I ask you to be to bring restoration 
I ask you to bring healing today. Replace my fear, replace my doubt, replace my anguish with faith in you. And may your peace, which surpasses all understanding, guard my heart and my mind in Christ Jesus. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you that there is nowhere that I cannot go beyond that is beyond your presence, dear Lord. That you transcend all of our understanding. I ask today that you would fill our relationships with peace that comes from your presence. Your word says that our faith will never be put to shame when our trust is in you. Thank you, Lord God. Give me faith in your power to restore my life. I humbly submit it to you today. Please help me to trust you with my whole heart. You are our sovereign God our King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light. Amen. To you be honor and eternal glory through Jesus Christ our Lord.